All right, cool. We are live right now. Thank you all for joining us today in the group. Um, I wanted to uh, bring my friend on here. Ayalani and I, we actually graduated the Institute of Integrative Nutrition the same time. And we were having a conversation about grains because I don't know if you've uh, read the blog post that I did after I, I read the book, um, Total Health Wheat Belly um, by Dr. William Davis. But all the stuff he was saying about, you know, how grains affect the neurological system and it can cause, you know, suicidal thoughts and you know, weight gain and brain fog and all these neurological disorders, bipolar disorder, ADHD, and all of that stuff. So he really paints a grim picture. And so um, Ayalani and I were just going back and forth talking about grains. So we're going to get into it, This the grains, the big debate uh, today. And if you want to chime in, please do um, comment below. Let us know where you're tuning in from, and what your thoughts are on grains. Do you eat grains? Do you love grains? Do you hate grains? Do you feel horrible when you consume grains? Um, Ayalani has a very interesting way in which she prepares grains, so I can't wait to to talk about that. But Ayalani, welcome. Um, just introduce yourself to Thank the you. group and um, tell people a little bit about your background. How did you even get into health coaching? Well, thank you very much for welcoming me, Samantha. It's, it's a real pleasure to be here today, especially talking about grains, because I'm very passionate about grains, unlike a lot of people. Uh, my background, actually, I was a, a, a professional singer and a fashion designer, and um, I traveled the world with my fashion and my music and in 2007 I actually collapsed in the gym one morning and for a whole year I was in and out of hospital and I lost my eyesight and that is what led me to natural therapies because the doctors couldn't work out and find out what exactly was the problem uh, so I made the decision I was going to study do the research and I was going to become a natural therapist which um, I've been in training since then and uh, just decided to complete IIN with Samantha's group, as she's just said. So I have um, experience in diverse disease because I was um, told I had chronic disease. I had fibromyalgia and um, along with lots of other little bits and pieces. But the main point was that I was told I had a, um, a stroke, a mini stroke, they called it. And uh, this, this actually led to my studies. So here I am today to talk about grains and debate this uh, topic with you. Well, you're so blessed to be here right now. That's awesome that you survived a stroke. I guess. Absolutely. Absolutely. Wow. Absolutely. So I wanted. So what inspired you to go vegan? It's so exciting to meet other health coaches that are actually vegan. Um, <laughs> It doesn't seem to be many in the group that we graduated with, but what inspired you to go vegan? Well, after my collapse and my, my health declining so rapidly uh, and doctors couldn't work out where the, the problems were coming from, I went to see every just, you can imagine, neurologist, any therapist. Mm. The, the, the major point for me, the, the defining factor was when I looked at my nutrition and I realized that there was an imbalance in my body due to what I was eating so I threw out the meat and that's when I turned to being vegetarian first of all mm -hmm. and uh, vegetarian diets sometimes can be dangerous because what we do is we tend to fill up on cheese and unfortunately after much study and research I found out how bad that the dairy, the cheese actually was for me being one of the worst foods. So eventually I threw out the dairy, hence I'm now vegan and loving it. Awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, like that, the cheese situation seems to be really difficult for a lot of people. 
how how were you able to yes. get off of that? Like, was that a struggle for you to get off of dairy? You know, I'm very different to a lot of people. I have a, a really strong mind. When I make a decision, it happens straight away. Mm -hmm. Now, cheese for me was a huge part of my diet because I lived in Switzerland. So I ate a lot of cheese, fondues, raclette, you name it, all the foods, the best foods, you know, potato gratin, um, all the, the, my favorite foods all were, were riddled with cheese. And because I loved wine and champagne, of course, my daily dose of, um, <laughs> of cheese was really, really a big plate of cheese every single day, uh, from the camemberts to the blues to you name it. So was it difficult in Initially, I thought, whoa, this is going to be very difficult. But I went to focus on the mind over matter, which, you know, this is part of what I teach as well, training people the strength of the mind. Once you, you make that decision that this is what has to happen, then it, it happened. And yes, I did miss it. Um, occasionally when I'd see people eating cheese, I'd go, oh, and my children absolutely love cheese. They're all born in Switzerland, so they really Swiss, Swiss, Swiss. Yeah. But um, <laughs> for me, it was my health or my cheese. I chose my health. That's an awesome choice. <laughs> That's an awesome choice. I'm going to check in. Um, hi, Jan. Thank you for joining us. Mom is here. Thank you for joining us. Jan says, I love grains. I can't imagine not having them. Um, all right. So I want to ask you, what does your diet look like today then? So you're not eating cheese anymore. You're completely vegan. What do you eat on a, on a typical day? Okay. A typical day for me looks like First thing in the morning, I must have my warm lemon water. I believe this is something everybody should do. Warm lemon water, it kickstarts your um, your uh, gut, gets it all ready for your bowel movement, and it also balances the pH. As we know, when we go to bed at night, our bodies do a whole lot of work, and our pH balance is completely out of whack. Then I have a, a morning juice which I make from fresh aloe vera from my garden and grapes. And I have this um, every single morning. I've just turned 53, hey. so I make... <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> you look amazing. So I, thank you. So I make sure I have every morning with my morning juice, I make sure I have a um, an iron pill. I'm only doing it now because at my age, I'm still menstruating. So I really need to keep up my, um, my iron levels. After I have uh, my morning juice, then I have my wonderful grains. Now grains for me is a very important part of my diet. I make sure I rotate my grains, but we'll talk about that later. Okay. So I have my grains about probably an hour after my morning juice. Mm -hmm. And then I um, have nothing for about five hours. I then have my lunch, which usually is maybe a vegan stir fry. Mm -hmm. It could be um, a polenta. I believe in America you call it grits. Yeah. Grits. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yes. And uh, I may make it with lentils or I make a curry either with rice or with, um, you know, it just depends. Every day is different. Sometimes if it's hot, I have a really nice big vegan salad. I'll have a vegan burger. Um, my diet is really, really, really good. And it includes a lot of grains. Yes. And I, I usually don't have dinner. Um, I may have a piece of fruit or I may have a few olives with um, one tomato and a half of avocado um, if I'm really feeling the need for it. But generally, I try not to eat too much at night. I see. I see. Which is great because then you're not going to bed on a full stomach. That's correct. Yeah, correct. that's great. So I don't think you mentioned, did you mention, did you tell everybody that you're actually to coming to us from Australia right now. So you're actually in the future. <laughs> We're talking to you yes. tomorrow. 
I'm ahead of you all. For me, it's uh, 10 to 9 in the morning. Yeah. So, yes, coming to you from Western Australia. And it's, it's so nice that uh, the social media has given us these possibilities to talk to each other around the world uh, because I actually train students all over the world um, on natural therapies. So these mediums are just amazing that we can use them for, you know, uh, talking to each other every way. That's fantastic. Yes, make the world so much smaller. So tell us about the grains then. So what is your take on grains? Obviously you love grains, you think it's essential, um, and you're eating it, it sounds like breakfast and lunch every day. Yes, Okay. every day. So how, how does your body, I guess your body is feeling really great on it? How exactly Absolutely. are you preparing it though? Because you were telling me that you you cook it or soak it for an hour and a half. Like, how do you prepare it? Actually, that's where the problem comes in with most people and grains. Uh, you see, grains just as much as our nuts are full of phytic acid. We need to soak our grains to remove binds to minerals and uh, in the gastrointestinal tract and then unfortunately it cannot be absorbed and that's where the problem usually comes in with the grains so what we need to do we need to soak our grains for um up to between 12 and 24 hours wow it's yes now there are certain grains that you can soak for seven hours only and that's rice buckwheat and millet because those three grains have a low um levels of phytic acid so seven hours for those are fine when you soak your grains you need to put it into warm water uh, the warm water is actually filtered warm water it breaks down the phytic acid a lot quicker and you also need to have uh, an acid put into the the grain whilst it's soaking so I put lemon juice. You can use, there's diverse um, acids you can use. Um, some people do use, I believe, apple cider vinegar. I prefer lemon. So for every uh, cup of water, you put one spoon of lemon juice or um, if you're going to use any other acid into that water. The water needs to be warm. You cover it perhaps with a clean dish towel with a rubber band over your glass bowl and it needs to be in a warm place in your kitchen, 12 to 24 hours worth of soaking. And once it's soaked that length of time, it will actually, you can cook it shorter. Now, if you haven't soaked your grains for 12 to 24 hours, but you put it on, let's say, later in the evening and you wake up five o'clock in the morning and you notice it's only soaked eight hours, mm -hmm. you need to then cook it for perhaps an hour. Mm -hmm. And that's how we break down the phytic acids and that doesn't affect our uh, di the absorption uh, with our minerals and that's where the problem comes in with people and grains. It's, it's all in the preparation. Yes. So this makes total sense to me because it sounds very much like when people tell me they have a difficult time um, going vegan because they didn't get enough protein or um, it didn't work for them or they just say it didn't work for them. But then you start digging in and you realize, oh, because you're doing it wrong, <laughs> you know, it's not veganism that's bad, but it's like your methodology is wrong. Um, That's so exactly right, Samantha. Yes, I'm finding with my clients as well, I don't just put them onto a vegan diet. I first educate them as to what a vegan diet looks like, how it's prepared. I then do all the cooking demonstrations. I take them shopping. I show them how to shop, what to look for, and then I take them through the food preparation. And once I believe they know how to do it, then I say, now you, you're ready to change. I just had all my blood tests done uh, probably two weeks ago, and my doctor said, how can it be that at 53, your blood tests 
are just amazing. You don't have a lack of any any B, B12. Uh, your iron levels are really good, and uh, so is your calcium. And those are the three things they look for when they test for vegans, especially women my age who are still uh, menstruating, you know, like a teenager. And um, the cardiologist couldn't believe he took 45 minutes to get my heart rate up. He made me run on about a 5% um, uh, up, uh, sorry, what do you call it? Uh, on the treadmill, you know, to get me to get my heart rate going. So, uh, incline at, that's what it's called, yeah. yeah. So, I believe the grains is a powerful food. We just need to teach and educate people as to how to prepare them and, and the vegan diet. So, okay, so I have a whole bunch of questions for you. So with the 12 to 24 hours, that's that's a pretty lengthy time. So yes. if you're just starting, because I know for you, you've been doing this a long time. So I could just imagine you have the stuff preparing from yesterday for today and you're just rotating like that. But if you're just getting started, is there any kind of hacks to make this shorter? Like, can you cook it with something like a bay leaf or kombu or something like that to get rid of the phytic acid? You can actually soak them with those type of um, foods. Mm -hmm. And I preferably don't. For me, it's about becoming organized. You know, life, life, we need to be organized in every area of our life. And no matter what it is, whether it's looking at our uh, for primary foods, our relationships need to be organized. Our careers, we need to be organized. Likewise, with feeding our bodies, we need to be organized. Now, I go to bed at 8.30 at night, but I wake up at 5 o'clock in the morning. So I've got a lot of time in the morning to prepare. Um, so my food preparation is done very early, and I know that I'm doing every meal for, for two days value. So I cook for two days. So the, the, the following day, I'm not cooking at all. I can be just preparing and soaking grains. You can even soak your grains. Um, you know, you can have four containers in your kitchen soaking four or five grains and your beans. And as they're ready, you can uh, rinse them. You can put them into Ziploc bags and you can freeze them. And they're ready for just cooking. Or you just refrigerate it, depending on you know how much space you have in your, your freezer or your your fridge. But uh, that's how I prepare my kitchen. Um, I'll be doing a lot of cooking demonstrations in the very near future. Um, we getting ready to start shooting videos in um, two weeks. I have all my students. I've got fifteen students that will be on my property for uh, the whole month of July, and I'll be sharing a lot more. But please go ahead with your questions. Yeah, so so tell us a little bit more about that. You're talking about the retreats that you run, right, in Australia? Yes. And, Correct. And your students, they're coming from all over the world, or is it just Australians? I have uh, students from everywhere that are coming. Um, I have students from the Philippines, Myanmar. I have students from uh, Papua New Guinea. Um, I actually have a few students that would like to come from the U.S. A couple of IIN students have asked me, can they join the class? Uh, they said it wasn't possible this year, but next year, because I, I run four sessions per annum. I do a whole month. So I did March. Uh, we're doing July. We'll have another session in October. This year will only be three three times because I'm also a grandmother of three beautiful grandchildren, mm -hmm. and I have a lot to do in their lives right. too. So, I, yeah. <laughs> yeah, wow, you're living such a full life. That's awesome. Um, so, and you mentioned something about B12, right? So, this this one too is a little. Um, I guess controversial too. Uh, I personally, yes. I've been vegan for nine years. I've never taken a B12 supplement or any injections or anything like that. Um, it's mm -hmm. not anything that I've been concerned about, but I've heard, you know, Dr. Neil Barnard says to take it. Um, and I know some other vegans and raw vegans that take it and think it's really important for them to take it. Do you take anything? 
any B12 supplements. Now I'm going to just put it towards age. You and I are at the different um, spectrums of our lives. I'm 53 and you are a lot younger than I am. 30, yes. Um, so. You're 30. You're actually my son's age. <laughs> so, um, so at 30, your body is still, um, you know, promoting and presenting with all the the natural enzymes, the nutrients, the vitamins. You know, it, I mean, there's a lot of young people that are not because they're not eating correctly. However, you are. You are on a vegan diet, which no doubt you've got balanced really well because. Your B12, I don't know when last you checked your bloods, but if your B12 is good, obviously you're eating the right foods. Yeah. Um, what I suggest to most uh, of my clients when they're your age, younger, I suggest to get all their supplements from their food. I don't believe in supplementing. Now, once you get to a certain age, <laughs> when you get to a certain age, then I suggest start looking at supplementation. Um, I actually take a B complex every morning. Now, we also have to look at, um, so with our vitamin Bs, I take a B complex now because, like I said, I'm 53. I've gone past that age of producing um, a lot of natural, um, sub, you know, uh, nutrients, nutrients, enzymes in my body, and I haven't yet come through my menopausal stage, but I believe I would be perimenopausal right now. Um, however, for me, it's probably necessary to take calcium, uh, B complex, and my iron if only every time I am menstruating. Um, I also started to take a um, a, um, a probiotic. Thank you. I've started taking a probiotic now, uh, but we need to be very careful when we take our supplements because supplements um, should be taken at very specific times of the day. So, but your question really was about vitamin B. You don't need to take it if you're actually supplementing with the good whole foods. I don't believe we need to supplement, but age factor and look at past life. I, I lived on a pretty poor, well, it wasn't a poor diet, but it was high animal protein. I used to be a bodybuilder, soft body. So I did a lot of bodybuilding and I ate a lot of meat and a lot of salmon. And we all know those are the worst foods for us. But anyway. Yes. Okay. I want you to talk about the salmon. Why is that the worst? Because I know there's some viewers here that love to eat fish. Okay. And, now, and fish salmon in particular. Okay, fish in general, it's a large topic because when we look at our waters across the world, there's only two, two places in the world where the waters don't have mercury. Those are the deep waters of Canada and the deep waters of um, like Greenland, uh, those countries. So if you're eating fish from there, that's fine. But not a lot of people um, are able to get their hands on fish from those deep waters. Most of the waters across the world, as I said, are full of mercury. And that's why we do avoid eating fish. Now, when it comes to salmon, salmon is the food that's one of the foods that have the highest preservative um, um rate because in order to preserve the, the 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 fish they need to really put a lot of preservatives and salt all you have to do is eat a piece of it and you can tell you're eating salt with your, or you should i say you're eating fish with your salt <laughs> Yeah. So, just said, I ate so much of that, and I'm not surprised I collapsed in the gym, you know, because my diet was really meat, um, eggs. I used to have sometimes for breakfast four eggs with um, maybe 500 grams of salmon, and you know, just that in itself, tequila. And then I would wash it down with two cups of coffee so that I could get into the gym and pump. So, yes, my diet was very poor. Yeah. Well, yeah. now you're letting people know about your experience, which is which is great. Because Absolutely. these are all things yes. that, like, when I do health histories, they're all coming through on the form. 
And um, mm. when you're at that stage, it's hard to imagine that you're doing anything wrong because in the mainstream, these are healthy foods, right? So, Perfect. so yeah, it's great that you can speak from that experience. Um, mm. And I love what you said about the age and the supplements because I, I plan to have my mother-in-law who's in her 50s too on the show to talk about her experience because she's in the same stage of life as you. And what I noticed between her and my mom is when you get to that um, pre-menopause phase, you start yes. to have bone issues, you know, like pains in the hips and stuff like that. Um, because Correct. you start to experience mineral loss. And so it Correct. makes total sense to supplement to kind of just accelerate getting you know the body back to an optimal level um alongside still eating you know clean yes this this whole topic of grains i like the fact that you you know you bring in your experience from it you're not having any issues because basically you're soaking it for a day which i know most people are not doing that <laughs> Yes. You know, yes. and um, but and to you, cooking it for longer periods of time is not going to do anything. It really just needs to be soaked in that phytic acid and water needs to be drained off and then cooked at that point, right? Correct. Yes. And I would That's assume then the cooking is is a lot shorter at that point. Then cooking is a lot shorter. Like I said, if you don't soak your grains, you really need to cook, for an example, rolled oats. If you don't soak your rolled oats, you really need to cook them for perhaps an hour. I, if I forgot or have been really busy and I wake up and I go, oh, boy, I haven't soaked my grains and I look through my packs and there's no more soaked grains, um, I would cook rolled oats for approximately an hour, 45 minutes, two hours. Wow. As long as that, yes. Wow. On a very slow heat and just slowly cook it up. Um, but, you know, grains, um, I suggest people actually look at, um, I'm writing some blogs at the moment on grains, but Dr. Bernard talks about grains a fair bit. I noticed you did mention his name. And I love the things he says about grains. Look at the comparison they did, the studies with Japan. You know, the Japanese lived on grains throughout um, throughout history up until, I believe he said the 19, was it 1970s or 80s? And then the, the, that's when the, the health, their health declined. Diabetes came in and all sorts of things because they went from uh, grain foods to adding meats and, you know, the animal proteins in their diet. And we can look at that throughout history. Now, apart from all that, which um, I'm actually Christian, which I, do, I don't really like the name Christian. However, looking at the biblical diet that we were given by the creator, he gave us grains right in the beginning, which was in Genesis 129. So I like to point that factor out too, that if our creator gave us grains, we really need to understand that he knew and um, our bodies better than anybody else. If Mercedes-Benz um, tells you to put unleaded fuel into your vehicle, you're not going to put diesel, are you? And that's, that's <laughs> one of my points I like to make when I talk about uh, specific foods. Yeah. So I can tell you from my experience that I, everything that, well, most of the stuff that Dr. Davis talks about, and now Dr. Neil Barnard, just for the viewers who don't know, Dr. Neil Barnard is a doctor that promotes a plant-based diet. And Correct. so grains are a crucial part of what he recommends as part of the, the daily diet. Now, Dr. William Davis wrote a series of books called um, talking about wheat, wheat belly, wheat belly total health. Um, and mm. there's a few other people, researchers that talk about, you know, the negative effects of grains. Now in yes. this book, when I read it, I was like, wow, yes, uh, weight gain, check. I have had that. And when I first went vegan, I did not like vegetables. So I ate a lot of um, bread. I ate a lot of pasta and I gained weight. 
And I was working right. a lot. Like every day I was working out and I was gaining weight. Uh, I got to the heaviest I had ever been in my life um, on a vegan diet because I was eating so many grains. Um, and the brain fog and feeling lethargic, all of those things mm. and mood swings and all of that. Now, what I've never done is cook my grains for 20 or soak them for 24 hours. <laughs> so I, you know, so just to put that in the mix, like, you know, I've yeah. had the experience of the negative effects of grains. Um, mm. And then I've had the experience of being fully raw and just feeling vibrant and alive and just like, you know, not dealing with those issues, but I've never done grains the way Ayolani's explaining. So if grains is something you enjoy, then this this is an option for you. And we're looking forward to seeing your tutorials and your videos um, on how you manage that whole thing, how you're running your kitchen and planning all of that. I think that would be really helpful um, for people. I just want to actually look at something with your own experience that you've had. Yeah. Uh, sometimes we look at one perspective. When we become vegan, we eat grains, but we also eat a lot of nuts. Now, nuts actually also have an issue. They're also full of phytic acid, and nuts actually carry a lot of fat, whereas grains don't. So I'm wondering if you did actually look in detail to where your health was at. Did you look at every um, thing you were eating, or did you just go straight to grains? Because to me, it sounds like a lot of experiences I've seen already where vegans go full out for nuts, and nuts are full of phytic acid and also need to be. As I said, nuts also have a high fat content, which you're going to put on weight if you eat lots of nuts, yes? Yes. And that's a great point. Thank you so much for mentioning that. Yeah, for me, um, I cannot have, and it, it doesn't even matter if it's nuts. It, it could be avocados. Um, what else? It could be even now coconut water, which before I used to go crazy on coconut water. But I cannot, like, have, um, and with coconut water, I don't even think the fat, there's like fat content in there that would be, you know, even anything. But fats, mm -hmm. I need to really keep it at 10% or less. This is what I've observed for me because um, the grains affect me in one way, like I said before, but the fats is like a physical pain I'm hurting. Like my stomach is just in knots. Um, so... So yeah, that's a great point. And that it doesn't matter if I soak them, um, which of course, you know, you should to release the phytic acid and so you can absorb the nutrients and stuff like that. But like I said, same with avocados. And so yeah, it's, it's, it's one of those things. And that's why I always tell people, and we talked about this on the live stream yesterday, uh, everyone's body's different. So like my husband, and I've, I noticed this a lot with couples, like the women tend to be able to handle a lot less fat than, um, than their, you know, yes. their partners. Yes. Um, and that's the case, like with my husband, he can eat way more fat than me and he's not ever going to gain weight. I don't know. We'll see when he hits 50, 60, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> what happens, but, that's um, same with my husband too. Yes. Yeah, because exactly. their metabolism is, is just different. Um, yes. But, like, with me, I don't gain weight really from plant-based fats. I just mm -hmm. feel pain. But with, okay. like, with grains, because in my family, so my family's from Jamaica, and they're used to having a hot breakfast. So I was raised on a hot breakfast. Even American cereals, I would warm my milk and eat it yes. hot, right? So I, yeah. I had a lot of oatmeal, and oatmeal was like a staple every morning. Um, but mm -hmm. having grains like every day for the week, by day three, I'm noticing my pants are getting tight, you know, like it's pretty mm -hmm. quick. It's, it's not digesting. But again, I don't soak yeah. it, you know, for, for 12 to 24 mm -hmm. hours. So Yeah, I, I still believe there's something else that goes on in your gut. I don't think it could just be the healthy fats. 
because our bodies are created to eat all those healthy natural foods. Mm -hmm. Avocado is fantastic to balance the women's hormones, you know. Uh, there's some amazing things in avocado that women actually need. So I eat avocado most days. Um, me, I me probably too. I eat avocado almost every day, but I just can't have like I'll have like a quarter of an avocado. There was a time right. when I would have half, but I could never eat more than half without you know feeling horrible. <laughs> But, you know, that's probably your body telling you you've now got enough fats because a half an avocado, depending on the size of the avocado, for yeah. most people is probably sufficient as, as a fat mm -hmm. and as, as a healthy, you know, part of your meal. So your body was, is probably really, you know, you, you can hear your body because it speaks very clearly and loudly, whereas, whereas some people, they don't. Um, necessarily feel the pangs of what's actually going on, but several years down the track, they have chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, diabetes, cancer, stroke, heart, what, whatever, you know, so it's great that your body tells you instantly enough. Yeah. So I, I think that's a pretty good thing anyway. Yeah, and you guys, this is, the, this is the benefit. You're actually getting to see what coaching is like, what's going here, Correct. asking questions, um, getting yeah. feedback, listening to your body. So like what Ayalani was just saying is, you know, a lot of times we have our head down, we're focused on making money, providing for our family. We're not even listening to our bodies because we're busy with this worldly stuff, right? And yes. so a coach just helps you to kind of tune in, okay, well, what was going on there? What was happening there? So you can, you know, just help you to connect the dots. And your body, everyone's body's unique. So, you know, what works for me, yes. even though Ayalani and myself, we're both eating plant-based, how we're eating mm. is different. Like Ayalani mentioned, oh. she's in a different stage of life than I am. And mm. our guts are different. You know, you're coming from, where were you born? Were you born in Australia? Or no, I was actually born in Africa. Oh, where? I was born in Zambia, but I never lived there. I lived in Zimbabwe as a little girl. So my background, my father is uh, was half African Welsh, and my mother is French Indian, uh, of her descent, her background. So I'm a, a mix, a bit so. <laughs> See, and so that's the point that I was getting to. Your whole culture and what you were raised yes. eating means that the bacteria yes. in your stomach is different than mine. Um, like, like with Correct. my family coming from Jamaica, they don't eat a lot of fermented foods. They really do maybe sorrow but the way they make it i don't think that would even really be considered fermented and we they only really drink it around like christmas time but like my husband and his Correct. family they're from poland sauerkraut and all this other stuff you know they're used to eating a lot of fermented food so their gut bacteria is going to be different you know oh, yeah. Yeah. And that's right. That's why we, we need to be very conscious, especially when we marry mix. My husband is, um, he's Australian, but born in Africa of English descent, but was as a baby eating Indian and African foods. Mm -hmm. So his body and my body have a very similar beginning. Um, which makes it very easy for me to feed us both. And then as an eight-year-old boy, he was in the UK eating all the English foods. Now, I was raised in Zimbabwe, which is an English colony, so we had the mix of those foods too. So definitely we need to go back and look at our beginnings, our cultural backgrounds and feed. And that's what I talk to my clients about too. It's not because um, you in Australia, I've got quite a few students from Myanmar. Now the Myanmar people were used to rice, like they, they're Asian, a lot of rice and vegetables. And uh, in Myanmar, it's a, you know, a, a country where that's that the meat was very expensive and then some of them moved to um, Singapore or Malaysia and that's when they started eating a lot of meat and they found that they're not sure why their health is declining so I had to uh, educate them as to well you started off with this diet you continued on a different path and now your body is really saying I don't want that I don't want that <laughs> so yes but just going back to grains which was our topic uh, there is about 1% of people in the world that are um, celiac 
So we need to consider those people as far as grains are concerned because the gluten is going to be a problem. Uh, there's between 7 and 9 percent of people in the world who are gluten intolerant. However, they can eat um, certain uh, grains but not gluten. So there are people who, who have those issues. My retreat is actually I serve uh, gluten-free foods as well. And I do cook in separate pans and pots for the gluten intolerant, for the celiacs, etc. So we need to be mindful that some people definitely cannot have um, the grains. And that's a very small minority, as I said, approximately 1% people of the world. And 7 to 9% people that can have grains but cannot have gluten. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. This is a conversation Ayalani and I had um, on a live feed in my Facebook group, the Raw Food Health Empowerment Circle. If you're interested in being part of the group, um, there's a link in the description box below so you can request an invite. And if you love grains, you've heard and learned some helpful tips on how you can continue to eat grains and possibly it won't cause all the detrimental effects that Dr. William Davis talks about in his book, Wheat Belly Total Health. Um, for me personally, I am not at the level where I'm committed to <laughs> spending that much time in preparation for my food. I like things to be quick and easy, so it's just not worth it for me at this stage of my life to invest um, so much time in preparing it. I would rather um, eat raw and just avoid grains, me personally. But if grains is something that you enjoy eating, then you have all of these tools and strategies to kind of help uh, alleviate any kind of detrimental effects to your digestive and neurological system. Alright, until next time, have a blessed day you guys.